Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Barnes, Dr. Deborah Barnes, the interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and I want to welcome you to this most auspicious occasion this morning. Uh, we have been hosting the Trotter Group since Sunday, and this is a very elite group of political um, editorialists and journalists who are freedom fighters in their own way. So I am most delighted to have them here. And for one of our featured guests today, we have Tim Reed. And perhaps you know him from Sister Sister, but I go back a little further Frank's than play. that. Frank's, Frank's, place. Frank's Place. Oh, see, you're old. I was going back there. <laughs> to Frank's Place in WKRP Cincinnati, which is hilarious if you have not seen it. Um, but he is so much more than a TV personality. And this is something that certainly MassCom students ought to appreciate, that there are so many different road paths you can take, some of them simultaneously. So in addition to being a celebrated um, TV personality, he is also, perhaps you don't know, a, um, a, a documentarian and also a um, producer of films. Before there was Oprah, before there was Tyler Perry, there was Tim Reed. And he had his own studio and back lot in Petersburg, Virginia, home to the movies. Right? You didn't think about that. And so um, we, we want you to think about these things because there's so many things you can do with this career uh, to certainly solidify your um, economic standing. I know most people think about working in front of the camera, but there's so many things that you can do not only to, to stabilize yourself, but also to make a political statement, to, to be in control of the images and the messages that we give to each other. Uh, one of the things that came out of our uh, meeting yesterday is that we certainly, as African-American um, professionals in this uh, business, need to be in control of telling our stories. We don't want other people to always tell our stories. We want to tell our own stories in the most uh, correct and valid way. And so, not to take any more time, I want you to welcome Mr. Tim Reed with one housekeeping note before you welcome him. If you have to leave to go to class, please exit through the upstairs door. We're going to close this door so as not to interrupt our speakers and Mr. Reed. <coughs> Thank you. As she said, I'm Tim Reed and I used to be famous. <laughs> um, I'm going to, because I understand some have to leave, so I'm going to go through this hopefully uh, quickly, but uh, I have to change my approach because I was, um, I had come initially to speak to uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the press about career changes and and the power of the media in terms of their expertise and how it can translate and also move into my area of uh, television and uh, film and documentary. But because we have some students, so I kind of have to do a hybrid presentation uh, to also hopefully uh, inspire uh, you to ask a few questions. So the first part of this will be more broad space and then the last part hopefully I will engage the. Uh, the professional journalists here about uh, opportunities and, and how I see their expertise being merged into the 21st century need to tell stories. Uh, as I said, I am and I have always been, even before I knew I was, a griot, a storyteller. <clears throat> and uh, I was trained as a young kid to be a storyteller. I didn't realize it. And uh, I find myself now 40-something years in the business of doing the same thing, telling our story. Uh, as a kid, uh, we'd leave choir practice on Thursdays, and I'd stop by my grandmother's house with my father, and the first thing she would say, all right, you know, tell me what happened at church tonight, and we'd tell the story. Well, so-and-so fell down, and so-and-so was dating so-and-so. And as a kid, I was always at the knee of my grandmother, and she would always ask me, tell the story. Who, what happened? What happened? And I grew up being a storyteller. The problem that I find is that we have forgotten how important the oral tradition of storytelling is to a culture. And we uh, have allowed our culture to be put in the hands, and the mouths, and the ears, and the eyes, and the professionalism of someone other than our own cultural uh, uh, interest. Um, and that has been very detrimental to us as a people, no matter where we are. The African diaspora, wherever it is, and I have spent the last 
18 years traveling the world, studying the African diaspora and finding incredible stories. And um, wherever I go, the tradition and the challenges are the same. But the first thing I want to say to both the journalists as well as uh, people who are aspiring to get into our business of uh, being in charge of your story, the word is first. And uh, no better way to start that than to hear this young lady tell us the importance. Words are things, I'm convinced. You must be careful about the words you use. Are the words you are allowed to be used in your house? In the Old Testament, we are told in Genesis that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God. That's in Genesis. Words are things. You must be careful. Careful about calling people out of their names, using racial pejoratives and sexual pejoratives and all that ignorance. Don't do that. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls. They get in your wallpaper. They get in your rugs, in your upholstery, in your clothes, and finally into you. That has been driven into me uh, more so. Thank you. Has been driven into me over my career, and uh, it hasn't always been a lesson that I've enjoyed learning. But um, about 20 years ago, uh, I was making a film called Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored. And I was shooting down in North Carolina, and uh, we had to do a scene. And the scene had been written, and um, Al Freeman, the late Al Freeman, a uh, powerful actor, um, was having problems delivering the lines. And not so much the lines, he just didn't believe it. He said, he came to me and he said, Tim, I, 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 don't, I don't quite feel this. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. I, I think I'd say something different. I said, well, what is it, Al? He said, well, he said, you sure this is all right? I said, yeah, tell me what you're feeling. And he began to explain what he was feeling. And um, uh, I brought my, my wife with me. I said, Daphne, come here, bring a pencil, a piece of paper. I said, again, express yourself. He expressed himself. She wrote it down. I said, OK, go type that up. And she left and went and typed it up and came back with about four pages of uh, scripted uh, material. And I handed it to him. And he looked at it. He looked at me. He said, uh, you want to shoot this? I'm going, yeah, let's shoot it. He said, don't you have to? Ask somebody? <laughs> I said, Al, I am somebody. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said something that I will never forget. He says, in all my years of acting, I have never had this opportunity to say what I felt and not have to go through a filter. And that, that point is when I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to build my own studio. I'm going to take the money I've made over the years and build a studio so that I have control over the words, yeah. control over the story, story, stories. And that's what I did. And we built a studio in Petersburg, Virginia. And since then, we have been laboring. I have not been as successful as I had hoped. I, I admire and take my hat off to Tyler Perry for what he's done. Uh, it is an incredible challenge to do what we do. Um, <clears throat> why is it so important? Image propaganda as it relates to the people of African descent <coughs> around the world is mediocre at best. The internet age coupled with bad writing is destroying what little culture integrity that manages to exist. <coughs> uh, I understand the happiness, but I wouldn't applaud that. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a tragedy. It is, but um, it's a, you recognize it. We need to do something about it. We not definitely the, do. Not that the recognition is out there. And why is it important? Well, it's important for many reasons, but I had a lesson given to me in 1988. I happened to be called to New York. I had just uh, done a pilot for a show called Frank's Place, the gentleman mentioned it. And the show was uh, confusing a lot of people at BlackRock. BlackRock is in New York. It's the headquarters for CBS television network. And um, 
At the top of this building is an office that takes up the entire floor for this gentleman here, the late William Paley. Now, the journalists here know who that is. Most of the young people don't know who William Paley is. He's passed away now. Uh, William Paley is the father of television. He created CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, which is known as CBS. And he's responsible for the format of news reporting on television. Uh, he had the network and controlled it for many years and um, was responsible for some incredible careers of journalists from Walter Cronkite to Edward R. Merrill, on and on and on. He was an interesting man. I had the pleasure of being asked to come and see him. Uh, he found out I was in the building, and he said, I want this gentleman up in my office. Well, when Mr. Paley calls, boy, things begin to happen. First thing they did was whisk me and my, my wife into a room and said, you have to be debriefed. I thought I was going to see the Pope. <laughs> so we mean debriefed, so you got to be debriefed. So for 45 minutes, the president of the network at that time, Tom O'Leary, was nervous. I mean, he was more afraid than I was. Um, now, I don't know if you saw the movie Good Night, Good Luck about Edward on Earth with, with, with Clooney. Well, there's a scene in that movie where Franklin Langella plays William Paley, and, and George Clooney has to go up to his office. And in the movie, it's black and white, but in the movie, you get some concept of power. Because it's one elevator, true, that goes from the ground up 60-something flights to his office. One elevator, and it can only be taken by someone who's invited to get on the elevator. So you get on this elevator, you go up, the door opens, and the room is about the size of this room flat. It's a huge room. And in this room, there's a, two sofas, some plants, a desk with a woman behind it, and nothing else but beautiful art all around the wall. Beautiful art, originals, Grecos, you name it. And you get in there, it's so big you get an echo. Hello, hello, I'm here to see Mr. Paley, Paley, Paley. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Tim Reed, Tim Reed? And they said, all right, have a seat. And you sit there, you, feel, you are intimidated. You feel like, oh my God, I'm, I, this is a day of judgment. <laughs> so finally, after about 15 minutes of sitting there, she said, you can go in now, now. <laughs> now, here's the problem with that meeting. That day, I didn't know I was going to see Mr. Paley. Matter of fact, Mr. Paley had not seen an actor since Jackie Gleason. So the fact that I was going in, everybody in CBS, right? Everybody in CBS was, was like, why, why do they want to see this guy? So anyway, I go in the office. But what I, I realized as I was walking in, I happened to have on that day some of the worst colors that I've ever <laughs> worn. Because it's hot, it's like 90 degrees in New York. I had on some yellow pants, sandals, and a shirt that looked like a peacock threw up on it. My wife is dressed impeccably. And I'm going, not today. Why would I see Paley in yellow pants? We go into his office. We shut the door on a rodent. On the wall, there must be 30, 40 million dollars worth of paintings. I mean, it's just, you go, my God, this is real. We sit down, he sat, just like in the movies, with his back against a window with the sun blazing through it. So all you see is a silhouette of this old man who then had to be 80-something years old. And we sat down and we chatted for a few, days, um, for a few minutes. And I'm sitting there the whole time, so self-conscious about these yellow pants. And then he looked at me. And he said, young man, I've seen your show, and I like your show. As a matter of fact, I would have been proud to have it on the network when I ran it. And he looked at me, and he asked me a question that changed my life that day about media. He said, what is your propaganda? And I went, whoa. Suddenly, I was awake. I can't believe the man who founded television is asking me, what is my propaganda? I've used the word ever since. And I, and I spoke to him. I said, well, Mr. Paley, it was, uh, I was blessed to be able to touch my brain and my, and my lips to work them together. <laughs> I said, you don't know my culture. I said, I have not seen my culture as I know it on television ever. I said, there are people in a community that I grew up in in Norfolk, Virginia, that most people will never know. I said, my show is designed to introduce to America a group of people with character that are just unbelievable. And he said, are you going to keep the writers? I said, the writers who stay. He says, well, I, 
I wish you well. So, what did I learn from that? The power of propaganda. W.E.B. Du Bois said, all art is propaganda. All art. I wouldn't care what form it comes in. Newspaper, radio, painting. It is the propaganda of the artist. One of my favorite pieces, and my, I'm, I'm a, I'm a half-assed sculptor, and I studied uh, in Florence occasionally, and I love Florence because the history of that place is just unbelievable, not only the art. And I stand in front, I usually have an apartment near the academia where they have the David, and I stand often in front of the David just for hours, just watching this incredible piece of, of art done by Michelangelo. And there's one thing, if you notice the next time you see the David, David isn't circumcised. But he's supposed to be the king of the Jews. Impossible. He's not circumcised. So who is David? David is, and also the age of David in the, in the, in the book of Genesis, I mean not the book of Genesis, when, when David uh, conquered Goliath, he had just turned uh, a man. He was 13, 14, a young person. Who is this David, this man of 20-something years old that's passing to David? Well, he is a radical. This man is a radical who fought against the Catholic Church in France, I mean, in, in, in Florence. And Florence was constantly battling the Pope, whoever the Pope was. And Michelangelo was a radical. So that statue is a political statement, a stab in the eye of the Catholic Church. All art is propaganda. Mm. <clears throat> a picture is worth a thousand words. We've heard that so many times. Imagine a thousand words. One picture, one frame, one frame of a picture, and there are like 24 frames in a second. That's a lot of power. And one of the things that <clears throat> I've noticed in working with young filmmakers, writers, is that I think we have forgotten the power of words. That's why I started with uh, my Angelo statement. The power of images and what it can do to change the thinking, the attitudes of people we have forgotten our power. And I try every chance I get to reinforce any creative person, no matter what medium they work in, of their power. Once you understand your power, you become more responsible for your message. You know, a lot of young folks will come to me and bring me their films to look at, and they'll say, look at this film. It could be about anything, crack, I just, I don't know what these young people write about. <laughs> but I see these films, and I ask them, what's your purpose? They go, what do you mean? I said, what's your purpose? And they said, I want to make a lot of money. That's a byproduct. What's your purpose? Most of them don't have a purpose. I looked at the, the latest, I try to keep abreast with what's going on in the media. Uh, uh, what's the young lady uh, um, in, uh, with the big butt? What's her name? <laughs> no, 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 not that one. Nikki, thank you, thank you. <laughs> she, she manufactured that one. I look at her latest uh, video, Anaconda, and it is, it is really, from my point of view, uh, a waste of power. But I do not, and I'm against censorship of any kind, I do not go against her for doing it. But if I had the opportunity to meet her, I wouldn't attack her. I would ask her one question. What is your purpose? Yes. What do you want young first? I'd ask the same thing to Beyonce. What is your purpose? Mm -hmm. Why are you talking about surfing this and doing that? Mm -hmm. What is your purpose? We need to really get into that as creative artists. Always try to find the purpose, because hidden in the purpose is the propaganda. <clears throat> All artists are the gatekeepers of truth. We are the, we are the civilization's radical. If you're going to be creative and you don't have any radicalism in yourself, do something else. <laughs> Please. Because you're wasting the power of images. You're wasting the power of the word, the written word. Malcolm X says, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty, and make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. Purpose. And that's what's happening to us for now. We got a president who, given any other birthright, any other time in history, would be considered one of the most successful presidents that a country could have. 
Unemployment is at 5.7. There have been more billionaires created in the last uh, years of his administration than 10 of the presidents before him. Billionaires. Wall Street is at high. We now are independently uh, in terms of power and fuel. Never before. They were always talking, yeah, we're going to make our country independent, dependent on, on oil. We're now independent. None of that goes in. Why? Because of the power of media. We have been told and we have bought that he's a failure. He didn't believe in it. That's the power of media. <clears throat> the power of images to create perception and define reality. You know, we was, as a kid, when I was in school, we were reading, um, uh, we were worried about um, what was going to happen in 1984. Orwell had written this wonderful book, 1984. We're all, oh my God, I remember thinking about it. What is the world going to be like when 1984 comes? Or will we be a police state? What's going to happen? We'll be burning books. Of course, 1984 came. And we missed a book. And the book was written by Aldous Huxley, A Brave New World. <coughs> And in that book, he says, I'm not worried about people burning books. I'm worried about people not wanting to read a book. He says, I'm not worried about the reality of stormtroopers and police state. I'm worried about the fact that perception becomes reality. I remember President Bush saying, the most important thing is the perception of power, not reality. We now live in a world where perception is more powerful than reality. And who creates perception? You do. Writers, producers, television. Who are the most trusted people in news today? John Stewart. They even wanted him to host uh, Face the Nation. John Stewart, a comedian with great wit. Bill Maher. He and I hate each other. I almost knocked him out one <laughs> But he is very successful. And he defines the presidency. He, uh, if, if Cornell goes on that show one more time, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> you now have this a new guy on HBO um, Sunday, Saturday, last week. Um, what is his name? Oliver. Uh, what's his name? John. John Oliver. I was watching him this past uh, weekend. He had an incredible show where he tore up the, the perception of lottery. I don't know if you saw that, but if you can, don't get a rerun. Look at that show because it's, matched, it's made the newspapers. It was on Huffington, his show. And what he talked about was the illusion of the lottery. Now, y'all, you young folks know it as a lottery. Anybody over 40 knows it was what we used to call the numbers. <laughs> Another one of our things that they took and made it legit. They used to put you in jail for playing the numbers. <laughs> Trying to make a free combination for 50 cents. <laughs> now it's called the lottery and it's legit. And they tell you the reason for the lottery is that they're going to finance schools. And he broke down every declaration from these states, New York. And, and, you, and he had people saying, yes, $50 million is going to go to education. And then he showed the reality that money didn't go. This lottery business that are putting mostly poor people and lower class people in debt playing the lottery, billions and billions of dollars are going somewhere. And he broke it down. He's a comedian. Where are the news people telling these stories? Why aren't they telling these stories? Well, I'll tell you in a minute why. <clears throat> there are 1,500 newspapers or more, 1,100 magazines, 9,000 radio stations, 1,500 TV stations, 2,400 publishers, owned by only three corporations. Say that again. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wasting <can> words. <laughs> That's an amazing fact. Three corporations control 90% of everything we see, hear, read, write, entertain. Propaganda. William Pale, what is your propaganda? So consequently, these corporations define power. We're no longer in a democracy. I know we call it that. We're an oligarchy. We have wealthy people controlling politics, 
everything. It's a different world we live in. So as creative people, you have to understand what your job is. Your job is to get through that system. Your job is to use the tools at hand. Not 20th century tools, 21st century tools. That's one of the problems that most of us are having now, especially those of us who are trying to get in. We're still trying, we're trying to reach a 21st century mentality with 20th century tools. You're not going to make it. You've got to get up to speed with 21st century tools so that your propaganda is distributed properly and meet the people that it has to meet to get your story told. If Du Bois is correct, all art is propaganda, then the culture will live or die by its ability to control its propaganda. If you don't control your propaganda, you will be controlled by it from someone else. It's just a fact. <clears throat> I know you've heard this many times, but I always like to put it. Until lions have their historian, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunt. Mm. That is so true. Your job is to speak for the lion. That's what I do. I don't care about the hunter. I care about the lion. Why? Because that's what I am. I'm a radical storyteller. Telling the story of the hunter, these are just facts. And there's a reality to the fact that the hunter has killed the lion. We can't change reality. It is what it is. Facts are facts. Outcomes are outcomes. However, the story, the legend of that, should be retold to benefit the culture. It's time for the lion to have a story told. What kind of lion was it? Was it a cowardly lion? What was the character of the lion? We don't pay any attention to that. You've got to be able to speak for the lion because he's half of the story. The power of propaganda to influence opinion. That's what you do. That's what the journalists do. That's what you have to do in mass comm. They don't call it mass communications for nothing. <laughs> it is called mass communication. I'm always amazed at students who major in mass communication who do not communicate. I'm amazed. You don't ask questions. You sit back and say, I want to be a journalist. I want to be a newscaster. Splitting verbs. <laughs> you're, not training your, you're not training your skill. I look at your, your uh, uh, audiovisual uh, building over there. I went in last night for the first time. I'm amazed at the tools you have before you. You don't understand the tools you've got. I've gone to a lot of historical black colleges. And I'm telling you, this is the best I've seen in terms of tools. I'm not going to name the college.